Welcome everyone to Young at Heart. This is session number 180, a nice round number. And I'm Father James DeLucio with the Paulist Fathers, ready, willing, and able by the grace of God to share with you nursery rhymes, stories, songs, poems, Mother Goose, Aesop's fables, Lewis Carroll, limericks, larks, and such and other things to keep us all young at heart. We're now in the first week of Advent, the Friday of the first week of Advent. Have you lit your first Advent candle at your table when you've had supper this evening or about to have supper? And you note, of course, that the days are getting shorter and shorter and how much we need that soothing candlelight. I thought I'd begin tonight because I'm doing a shorter segment of a Thanksgiving visitor than I did last week. And I would like to share with you an Advent hymn. We don't know our Advent hymns, and I still have to, I don't have many of them memorized, so I thought I'd share a few of them with you, only one today, but I might share more during the week if you want to tune in and see and learn some Advent hymns. This one's one of my very, very favorites. It's called Creator of the Stars of Night. It's particularly good when we're lighting our Advent candle and the day is done and the night is already dark. Creator of the stars of night, your people's everlasting light, Jesus, Redeemer of us all, we pray you hear us when we call. Now grieving that the ancient curse should doom to death the universe, you heal all people with your grace to save and heal a ruined race. At whose great name, majestic now, all knees must bend, all hearts must bow. All things in heaven and earth adore, and own the King forevermore. To God the Father, God the Son, to God the Spirit, three in one. Praise, honor, might, and glory be. From age to age eternally. If it's a clear night and it's not too cold, you can go out and sing this to the stars. Or if it's too chilly, look out your window. Look up at the stars and light your candle and sing. Let us continue now with Truman Capote's The Thanksgiving Visitor. See in the previous Facebook uh, post, the first part of it, or if you're finding it difficult to find, go to my YouTube channel, James DeLucio, and look for the playlist, Young at Heart. It will be the last one on top, or the second to last one, because this one will be on top <laughs> shortly. My cousins had never married. Uncle B had almost married, but his fiancée returned the engagement ring when she saw a bra, bra, bra. <laughs> I'm going to be humble. I'm not going to start over. But his fiancée returned the engagement ring when she saw that sharing a house with three individual spinsters would be part of the bargain. However, they boasted extensive family connections throughout the vicinity, cousins aplenty, and an aunt, Mrs. Mary Tyler Wheelwright, who was 103 years old. As our house was the largest and the most conveniently located, it was traditional for these relations to aim themselves our way every year at Thanksgiving, though there were seldom fewer than 30 celebrants 
it was an onerous chore because we provided only the setting and an ample number of stuffed turkeys. How was your Thanksgiving? I hope it was a good one. The guest supplied the trimmings, each of them contributing her particular speciality. A cousin twice removed, Harriet Parker from Flomaton, made perfect ambrosia. Transparent orange slices combined with freshly ground coconut. Harriet's sister, Alice, usually arrived carrying a dish of whipped sweet potatoes and raisins. The Conklin tribe, Mr. and Mrs. Bill Conklin, and their quartet of handsome daughters, always brought a delicious array of vegetables canned during the summer. My own favorite was a cold banana pudding. I love banana pudding. Do you? A guarded recipe of the ancient aunt who, despite her longevity, was still domestically energetic. To our sorrow, she took the secret with her when she died in 1934, age 105. And it wasn't age that lowered the curtain. She was attacked and trampled by a bull in a pasture. Miss Souk was ruminating on these matters while my mind was wandering through a maze as melancholy as wet twilight. Suddenly, I heard her knuckles rap the kitchen table. Buddy! What? You haven't listened to one word. Sorry. I figure we'll need five turkeys this year. When I spoke to Uncle B about it, he said he wanted you to kill them. Dress them, too. But why? He says a boy ought to know how to do things like that. Slaughtering was Uncle B's job. It was an ordeal for me to watch him butcher a hog or even wring a chicken's neck. My friend felt the same way. Neither of us could abide any violent violence. Neither of us could abide any violence bloodier than swatting flies. So I was taken aback at her casual relaying of this command. Well, I won't. Now she smiled. Of course you won't. I'll get Bubber or some other colored boy, pay him a nickel. But she said her tone descending conspiratorially. We'll let Uncle B believe that it was you. Then he'll be pleased and stop saying it's such a bad thing. My apologies for the phrase colored boy, but it's 1930s in the South. But it's good that we feel a little bristle at this type of condescension. What's a bad thing? I asked. Always being together. He says you ought to have other friends, boys your own age. Well, he's right. I don't want any other friend. Hush, buddy. Now hush. You've been real good to me. I don't know what I'd do without you. Just become an old crab. But I want to see you happy, buddy. Strong, able to go out into the world. And you're never going to until you come to terms with people like Odd Henderson and turn them into friends. Him? He's the last friend in the world I want. Please, buddy. Invite that boy here for Thanksgiving. Though the pair of us occasionally quibbled, we never quarreled. At first, I was unable to believe she meant her request as something more than a sample of poor taste humor. But then, seeing that she was serious, I realized with bewilderment.
that we were edging toward a falling out. I thought you were my friend. I am, buddy, truly. If you were, you couldn't think up a thing like that. Odd Henderson hates me. He's my enemy. He can't hate you. He doesn't know you. Well, I hate him. Because you don't know him. That's all I ask, the chance for you to know each other a little. Then I think this trouble will stop. And maybe you're right, buddy. Maybe you boys won't, won't ever be friends. But I doubt that he'd pick on you anymore. You don't understand. You've never hated anybody. No, I never have. We're allotted just so much time on earth, and I wouldn't want the Lord to see me wasting mine in any such matter. I won't do it. He'd think I was crazy. And I would be. The rain had let up, leaving a silence that lengthened miserably. My friend's clear eyes contemplated me as though I were a rook card she was deciding how to play. She maneuvered a salt-pepper lock of hair off her forehead and sighed. Then I will. Tomorrow, she said. I'll put on my hat and pay a call on Molly Henderson. This statement certified her determination, for I'd never known Miss Sook to plan a call on anyone, not only because she was entirely without social talent, but also because she was too modest to presume a welcome. I don't suppose there will be much Thanksgiving in their house, she said. Probably Molly would be very pleased to have Odd sit down with us. Oh, I know Uncle B would never permit it, but... The nice thing to do is invite them all. My laughter woke Queenie, and after a surprised instant, my friend laughed too. Her cheeks pinked, and a light flared in her eyes. Rising, she hugged me and said, Oh, buddy, I knew you'd forgive me, and recognized there was some sense to my notion. She was mistaken. My merriment had other origins. Two. Two. One was the picture of Uncle B carving turkey for all those cantankerous Hendersons. The second was, it had occurred to me that I had no cause for alarm. Miss Sook might extend the invitation, and Odd's mother might accept it in his behalf. But Odd wouldn't show up in a million years. He would be too proud. For instance, throughout the Depression years, our school distributed free milk and sandwiches to all children whose families were too poor to provide them with a lunchbox. But Odd, emaciated as he was, refused to have anything to do with these handouts. He'd wander off by himself and devour a pocketful of peanuts or gnaw a large raw turnip. This kind of pride was characteristic of the Henderson breed. They might steal, gouge the gold out of a dead man's teeth, but they would never accept a gift offered openly, for anything smacking of charity was offensive to them. Odd was sure to figure Miss Sook's invitation as a charitable gesture, or see it, and not incorrectly, as a blackmailing stunt meant to make him ease up on me. I went to bed that night with a light heart, for I was certain my Thanksgiving would not be marred by the presence of such an unsuitable visitor. The next morning, I had a bad cold, which was pleasant. It meant no school. It also meant I could have a fire in my room and cream of tomato soup 
and hours alone with Mr. Micawber and David Copperfield, the happiest of stay abeds. It was drizzling again, but true to her promise, my friend fetched her hat, a straw cartwheel decorated with weather-faded velvet roses, and set out for the Henderson home. I won't be but a minute, she said. In fact, she was gone the better part of two hours. I couldn't imagine Miss Sook sustaining so long a conversation except with me or herself. She talked to herself often, a habit of sane persons of solitary nature. And when she returned, she did seem drained. Still wearing her hat and an old, loose raincoat, she slipped a thermometer in my mouth, then sat at the foot of the bed. I like her, she said firmly. I always have liked Molly Henderson. She does all she can, and the house was clean as Bob Spencer's fingernails. Bob Spencer being a Baptist minister famed for his hygienic gleam. But bitter cold with a tin roof and the wind right in the room and not a scrap of fire in the fireplace. She offered me refreshment and I surely would have welcomed a cup of coffee, but I said no because I don't expect there was any coffee on the premises or sugar. It made me feel ashamed, buddy. It hurt me all the way down to see somebody struggling like Molly, never able to see a clear day. I don't say people should have everything they want, though come to think of it, I don't see what's wrong with that either. You ought to have a bike to ride. And why shouldn't Queenie have a beef bone every day? Yes, now it's come to me. Now I understand. We really, all of us, ought to have everything we want. I'll bet you a dime. That's what the Lord intends. And when all around us we see people who can't satisfy the plainest needs, I feel ashamed. Oh, not of myself, because who am I? An old nobody who never owned a mite. If I hadn't had a family to pay my way, I'd have starved or been sent to the country home, rather, been sent to the county home. The shame, I feel, is for all of us who have anything extra when other people have nothing. I mentioned to Molly how we had more quilts here than we could ever use. There's a trunk of scrap quilts in the attic, the ones I made when I was a girl and couldn't go outdoors much. But she cut me off, said the Hendersons were doing just fine, thank you. And the only thing they wanted was Dad to be set free and sent home to his people. Miss Sook, she told me, Dad is a good husband, no matter what else he might be. Meanwhile, she has the children to care for. Pardon me. <coughs> Tickle in my throat. Ah. Uh, Thank the Lord for water. Oh, I was very thirsty. It's good to drink water. Have some. And buddy, she continued, you must be wrong about her boy, Odd. At least partially, Molly says he's a great help to her and a great comfort. Never complains, regardless of how many chores she gives him. Says he can sing good as you hear on the radio. And when the younger children start raising a ruckus, he can quiet them down by singing to them. Bless us, she lamented, retrieving the thermometer. All we can do for people like Molly is respect them and remember them in our prayers. The thermometer had kept me silent. Now I demanded. But what about the invitation? 
Sometimes, she said, scowling at the scarlet thread in the glass. I think these eyes are giving out. At my age, a body starts to look around very closely. So you'll remember how cobwebs really looked. But to answer your question, Molly was happy to hear you, though, to, um, wait. But to answer your question, Molly was happy to hear you thought enough of Odd to ask him over for Thanksgiving. And she continued, ignoring my groan, she said she was sure he'd be tickled to come. Your temperature is just about over the hundred mark. I guess you can count on staying home tomorrow. That ought to bring smiles. Let's see you smile, buddy. As it happened, I was smiling a good deal during the next few days prior to the big feast, for my cold had advanced to croup, and I was out of school the entire period. I had no contact with Odd Henderson, and therefore could not personally ascertain his reaction to the invitation, but I imagined it must have made him laugh first and spit next. The prospect of his actually appearing didn't worry me. It was far-fetched. It was as far-fetched a possibility as Queenie snarling at me or Miss Sook betraying my trust in her. Yet, Odd remained a presence, a red-headed silhouette on the threshold of my cheerfulness. Still, I was tantalized by the description his mother had provided. I wondered if it was true he had another side, that somewhere underneath the evil a speck of humanness existed. But that was impossible. Anybody who believed so would leave their house unlocked when the gypsies came to town. All you had to do was look at him. Miss Sook was aware that my croup was not as severe as I pretended, and so in the mornings when the others had, absent, had absented themselves, Uncle B to his farms and the sisters to their dry goods store, she tolerated my getting out of bed and even let me assist in the spring-like house cleaning that always preceded the Thanksgiving assembly. There was such a lot to do, enough for a dozen hands. We polished the parlor furniture, the piano, the black curio cabinet, which contained only a fragment of Stone Mountain the sisters had brought back from a business trip to Atlanta, the formal walnut rockers and florid Biedermeyer pieces, rubbed them with lemon-scented wax until the place was shiny as lemon skin and smelled like a citrus grove. Curtains were laundered and rehung, pillows punched, rugs beaten. Wherever one glanced, dust motes and tiny feathers drifted in the sparkling November light, sifting through the tall rooms. Poor Queenie was relegated to the kitchen for fear she might leave a stray hair, perhaps a flea in the more dignified areas of the house. The most delicate task was preparing the napkins and tablecloths that would decorate the dining room. The linen had belonged to my friend's mother who had received it as a wedding gift, though it had been used only once or twice a year, say 200 times in the past 80 years. Nevertheless, it was 80 years old and mended patches and freckled discolorations were apparent. Probably it had not been a fine material to begin with, but Miss Sook treated it as though it had been woven by golden hands on heavenly looms. My mother said, the day may come when all we can offer is well water and cold cornbread, but at least we'll be able to serve it on a table set with proper linen. At night, after the days dashing about and when the rest of the house was dark, one feeble lamp burned late, while my friend, propped in bed with napkins massed on her lap, repaired blemishes and tears with thread and needle, her forehead crumpled, her eyes cruelly squeezed, yet illuminated by the fatigued rapture of a pilgrim approaching an altar at journey's end. And we'll 
close there. Come next week for the conclusion to the Thanksgiving dinner. Offer how you think this is going to end, your suppositions, and I'll be happy to comment on them with giving little clues if you wish. Have a great night, a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the advent of the second Sunday of Advent, which will begin tomorrow night after sunset and all day Sunday. Meanwhile, if you go out, wear your masks, stay safe, stay healthy. God bless. Bye, everyone. How long was this?